All right, guys, we are back and good to go. So what I've done at this point is the watch has been... All the necessary upgrades have uh, have taken place. Um, I've already fitted the shock protection on the balance, so that's already done. Um, we can see that we have a nice new jewel uh, in our main plate there um, for the barrel. We have uh, a nice new jewel in our bridge uh, fitted there, so all that wear is going to be taken care of. Um, we've got a clean barrel that's ready to have the mainspring installed. Again, we're going to use um, a new mainspring in that because we're not going to use that old one because it was uh, replaced and it's not the original anyway. So uh, we're going to put a new one in there. Um, one thing I didn't check. Yeah, here we go. I thought there was rust um, on the center wheel on the pinion, but it wasn't, it was just filth. So that was ultrasonically cleaned and then cleaned in the cleaner as well. So that wheel has actually come up great uh, and we're not gonna need to replace that. Um, I cleaned as much rust as possible uh, off our automatic framework here. And um, I actually tightened up uh, the ball bearings um, in, in that framework there. So we can see uh, it's tight, but let's focus up here. It's tight, but it's nice and free. So you see, we've still got that. You still want that freedom so that that oscillating weight um, uh, can be can can move around. So it's important. Well, it's it's not important, but it, these are hard to come by. These frameworks. Um, so I tighten them up where possible, just because it well it saves a part. It saves cost to the end consumer buying a new part. Um, and it works well, it's a, it's, a, it's a good solution. So uh, that's been fixed up and de-rusted. Um, I have, what else have I done? I have put, or I fixed our end shake, I should say. Fixed our end shake here. Um, for the um, minute recording wheel. Uh, so that's been done, and uh, we'll do a final check on assembly. Oh, and the other thing that uh, I did, which I forgot to mention, was um, I jeweled uh, our third wheel there. We had that bushing that was punched up uh, incorrectly, so that has had uh, a correct size jewel fitted in there as well. Okay, so I've now got my barrel assembled. Um, I've put the new mainspring in there. Um, unfortunately, there's not much we can do about those marks on there, but uh, but such is life. So what we want to do now is, before we put our mainspring in, we want to check our end shakes and make sure they're okay, because obviously we always want to check as we go. I see a lot of these come in with really big end shakes and it hasn't been taken care of. It's really important because we can foul in a lot of places if we don't check our end shakes there. And then obviously we wanna check our side shake too, which is, which is good. So we're nice and free at that point. Now, before we go ahead and put our train in, uh, there's something that's kind of not really talked about uh, very often, uh, but I'd like to address it here. Uh, it's EpiLam. Now, EpiLam is a coating. Uh, it comes in a little, well, I put it in a jar like this, and it's a fluid, and what it does is you put certain components in this fluid, and then you dry them with heat uh, so that oil doesn't creep. Um, it's really good if we do this to our escapements. Um, a lot of the reasons people don't use this stuff is because it's expensive. Um, it's not uh, It's not cheap to buy, Um but really, in the grand scheme of things, it's, it's not that expensive. It's the same reason people use uh, expired lubricants uh, or old lubricants just because they've had a bottle uh, laying around forever. So I'm going to go ahead and epilam these two parts uh, and then dry them um, in some heat. And then we can get to work on installing our gear train. Okay, escapement is out of the heater. It's been epilammed and we're good to go. So... Let's uh, let's start the assembly process. 
gonna start with our center wheel. And we're gonna lubricate. The necessary parts as we go. Bend my oiler. So we throw the center wheel in place. Now here's a tip for young players. Don't put your bridge on first, put your barrel on. Because it's hard to get underneath and then you might get lubrication where you don't want it. So lubricate your barrel arbor. Just noticed something I didn't pick up on. I'm uh, gonna throw a new barrel arbor in there because that thing is uh, pretty pitted and rusted. So I'm gonna just quickly swap that out. Yeah, I. Uh, it's a bit of a shame that especially because I didn't notice it. So yeah, it's just, uh, it's pretty damaged there. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna throw a nice new barrel arbor in there. Well, it's a used barrel arbor. Uh, I'm just gonna just clean it quickly and dry it off. It's a used barrel arbor, but it's uh, in good condition. So that's, uh, that's what I'm gonna throw in there and, and, and do. Because what'll happen is if it's worn, it won't wind, it's gonna create friction in that jewel. Uh, and then what's gonna happen is it's gonna not be as efficient when it comes to self-winding. Um, and then it's, it's not gonna keep going. When it comes to these, you know, I have an approach of, I don't want the watch to run for the warranty period. You know, this, well, this is my approach really with all watches, but I don't just want the watch to run for the warranty period. I want the watch to run for the next five to seven years without having to come back. You know, it's it's not expensive to service watches when you think about it, how often they run every day constantly um, and how often they need servicing. And when you amateurize that cost over the period, uh, they aren't hugely expensive. I'll just quickly check our intake again uh, to overhaul. But still, you know, it's expensive enough. So I don't want you guys coming back every two years to, to service your watch. So I like to fix things that aren't just going to cause immediate problems, uh, but are going to cause problems down the road. So we address those issues now, um, and then it gets it done. Because you have to remember most of these watches haven't been serviced for many moons. All right, so we'll lubricate our barrel arbor in the appropriate sections. And then we'll put that in the plate. Uh, now we will fit our bridge uh, like so. I just turned the music off to make these videos, but I'm thinking maybe I should just have the movement on in the background, uh, the music on in the background, so I don't just have to hear myself talking the whole time. All right, so now we're going to put our train in place. And then we'll pop our third wheel where it should go. Then I'm going to sit down. There we go. And we'll take a look at our chrono wheel. So it's pretty dirty when it came in. So we need to lubricate that chrono wheel. We need to get the lubrication inside that wheel. So let me press down. And capillary action takes it in to where it needs to go. Not too much, not too little. And we'll lubricate our square too. I'll pivot. All right, in we go. Now 
we can install our bridge, if I'm not mistaken. I don't think there's anything else that needs to go in there. Um, so we'll put our bridge in place. Give it the patented Ashton tap. I know you guys have been enjoying that tip. Everyone's been telling me, hey, that tap works great. It's such a simple trick. My instructor, Alan, at watchmaking school that taught me that. And uh, so many people don't know about it. And it's just one of the handiest things I was ever taught at watchmaking school. I think it should be part of the curriculum. Okay, so our screws are in place. Now, we have changed jewels and we have changed uh, bushings. So what we need to do is we need to check our end shakes. So they've already been checked, but we want to check them again. Okay, we've got freedom there. And then we also changed our third wheel. So we want to check our third wheel end shake. Again, already checked, but we need to check again. It's very important that we make sure everything's right because when everything's together and ready to go, it's a real pain to Okay, third wheel's good. Barrel's good. We'll check our flatness too. So we have put a bushing in. Obviously it'd be bad if anything was skew. That's why we do it in the lathe. Helps us to avoid those issues. Uh, with the centering microscope. And we look good. We're good at this point. All right, let us go and search for our click. Remember, we got to check our click because uh, the watch decided to the power uh, just when we moved something. So we're going to make sure our click is working properly. Um, unfortunately, we can't make sure it's working properly because until most of the watch is assembled because um, because of something. But I'm focused on something else right now. So it'll come to me. Can't find the click screw. Mm. Sometimes they're different. Well, I can't find it. I'm gonna put a placeholder screw in for now uh, for our click screw. And then it'll be one of the auto bridge screws. They got the same thread on them. So I'll put that in as a placeholder and then I'll worry about finding my click screw after. The beauty of the old Seikos, along with, you know, Rolexes, ETAs, they have a relatively simple screw structure. You take something like, uh, an El Primero, a Zenith El Primero chronograph, and honestly, that thing, lovely chronograph, people love them, you know, relatively good results when servicing them, but the amount of different screws in that thing is unbelievable. It's absolutely unbelievable. And you just, it's a nightmare to be completely honest. So I do appreciate the old Seikos with their screws. They, uh, they make life pretty easy. Oh, I just remembered something I forgot to show you guys. Forgot to address, but uh, I'll do that in a sec. Ratchet will screw, here we go. 
Man, I'm having a real problem uh, finding screws today, aren't I? Okay. I think we're okay with our click. I think the reason it wasn't working was because we had such a sloppy barrel. But I think we're okay now. Because we've fixed up all those issues. discoloration on the metal on the bottom there okay we then need to put our little thingy in a little intermediate wheel post but what we'll do before that is we'll throw a bit of 9010 on our train wheel pivots relatively fast moving wheels so we like 9010 there. We don't want to use something like HP 1300. We want to use 9010. Oh, and just a note, people have commented, oh, Seiko oils are available, this, that, use this, use that. Um, no. Uh, Seiko oils are old. They haven't been updated, those specific oils, for a long time. The Swiss watch industry puts a lot of work into different lubrication. So I'm gonna use the best lubricants that are available. They might not match up exactly with the Seiko uh, Tech Docs, but uh, they're 50 year old documents. Um, so we're gonna use modern oils to make sure the watch runs runs properly. Uh, so we've lubricated our pivots, we've put our, we've put our piece in there. Uh, the next thing we need to do um, is assemble all our chronograph pieces so that we can put those together. Got a bit of magnetism there we're gonna to have to deal with. So I like to kind of move all my all my components that are for the setting work uh, over to one side. Let's get our springs out the way. Uh, so that we know what we're working with. So we've got everything relatively easy to hand. We need that, we need that, we need that. Uh, don't need that. Definitely need that. We'll need those. And don't forget, we've got to find another screw because there was a screw missing when the watch came in. Um, because, you know, why not? Okay, so we'll go ahead and lubricate what's on there and what needs to be lubricated. I've actually started using 9504 on all the chronograph parts. It was uh, Adrian over at VTA that got me onto it. Well, actually it was Amiga that got me onto it because... Uh, I have, a, I have a Swatch Group Amiga account, and they require it for servicing the 861 Speedmaster. And um, I bought it so I could follow their technical information. And it's actually great. It's, uh, it's, it's a pretty good lubricant. Apparently, Adrian was explaining to me, um, it's a metal soap. So it makes a film, so at high speeds, it doesn't um, doesn't fly off at high speeds. So it's kind of cool uh, in that sense. Um, makes it makes it uh, a little more versatile. So yeah, pretty cool, pretty cool grease. I've been enjoying it. Not great for calendar work though. I still prefer, I do not like HP 1300 for calendars. Um, I still prefer DX for calendars. And the 9504, I 
Don't really cut the mustard, I find, for calendars. Um, needs a little bit of help, so. But I tell you, I got some, I got some cool projects coming up that I'm gonna uh, do some videos for. Um, again, I can't make videos for everybody for these watches, so I try to make videos of, of the interesting ones. Um, I guess I could make videos for everybody, but I'd have to charge you all a lot more. That's the problem. It's a very time consuming process. It's not just time consuming, it's kind of mentally exhausting to be completely honest. Um, you know, normally I just come in, put some music on, chill, get to work. Don't have to think too much. Um, well, I mean, I have to think about what I'm doing, but I don't have to think about things to say and, and, and constant engagement. So making videos for everything would be would be kind of tough, to be completely honest. So now we're going to lubricate uh, our big wheel. What do you call this thing? It's not a crown wheel, it's not a clutch wheel. You guys will be screaming at home, column wheel, it's a column wheel, that's what it is. It's not a cam chronograph, it's a column wheel chronograph. I'm sure there were plenty of people screaming at their screens going, it's a column wheel. This is what happens when you have a six month old baby. You forget things, you're tired. All right. Just gonna get this wheel in. And that's all she wrote. So we got our teeth lubricated that actuate. And now we just wanna actual uh, lubricate our actual columns so that when levers come around they have something to work with okay so next we can put on our little magic arms that work against our wheel and move it in and out of the way when it's required. Now we need to put our screw here. It's interesting. I can forget to put that screw in sometimes because everything works without it. It's like a safety. But then... Okay, so we got our screw in and we don't want that one, but we'll put our other screw in there. Good, and we'll just lubricate our metal to metal. General rule for watch lubrication. If there's friction, it needs lubrication. Except when it comes to our pallet pivots. And 
our intermediate recording wheel. All right, now we're gonna put the big sucker on. The big spring, the big spring. The other thing I did was I adjusted the end shake on that wheel just there. That's our, um, that's the bottom jewel for our um, automatic winding wheel. Um, I remember that had a very large end shake and was actually fouling um, when we when we took the thing apart. So that was another thing I adjusted. So as you can guys you guys can see, the store that said, "Oh, there's no parts available." Parts weren't really their problem. Um, their problem was not fixing all the issues that actually could be fixed. Because there's always jewels and bushings available. Um, you can fix end shakes. So as far as that goes, there's uh, not a lot that they needed to fix, to be completely honest. But hey, such is life. All right, we will lubricate our jumper. Oh, sorry, our hammer and our jumper. Next against our heart cams. We know we need to lubricate that before that goes on. All right, now we shall put all our appropriate wheels in place. And now our intermediate wheel. There's also no need to lubricate that intermediate wheel. What happens is if we intermediate, if we lubricate these, um, these, intermediate recording wheels and recording wheels, they start to, um, they have drag and they cause issues um, with that, so. Okay, now we will fit our sprung. Such a fun spring. That one likes to go ping. All right. Our spring's in place. And we now can fit our top bridge.
Now that we want to bring there. Okay, everything is in place. And we'll screw the rest of our screws down. So we've now got everything in place. Um, those screws are down. We checked our, checked our end shake again on our wheel. Um, and we're all good. So we just check that one more time. We got freedom. Which is good, but... Uh, so, we've got our screws in now, and uh, I've actually, I've lubricated the tram wheels on the other side. Um, our end shake is good for our minute recording wheel. I had to make a small adjustment because I wasn't happy, but uh, our end shake is now there, but minimal. So we're not fouling the top of the bridge. We've got enough freedom um, for everything to, to spin around correctly as it should. Now, one little test we can do to make sure our center chronograph wheel is working properly is we can put a bit of power to the train, and we can see that our train is spinning, but none of our chronograph wheels are. Now, what we can do is we can press the start for the chronograph, and we can turn, and we can see all our wheels move. So we've got nice freedom through there. So now we need to lubricate our big reset hammer spring. Because without lubrication, this thing don't work. Start, we stop, we reset, we start, we try and reset, nothing happens. Stop, reset. Sorry, I just did all that off camera. We start, we stop, we reset, we start, we reset, nothing happens. We stop, we reset. Everything's working as it should. So now we can fit our escapement. So what we'll do now is, like I said, we'll put the... Um, pallet fork in place. Uh, we already have the escape wheel uh, in place where it should be. So we need to find our correct screws because there's two sets of screws that are extremely similar. One goes into the automatic framework, one goes into the Um, pallet cock. And don't forget, I haven't forgotten that we need to uh, get one of the screws for the whatever you call this thing, the click. Okay, so here we have our pallet bridge screws. Get the arbor in. The pivot, sorry, and then we get our bridge in. And then we can put our screws in place. And we can put some power.
on our mainspring. Now what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna lubricate the escapement, fit the uh, balance, and we'll check our initial timing results. Okay, so we've got our watch ticking. Uh, chronograph isn't running at this point. Um, so we'll make sure that uh, our chronograph runs. Let me start it, and the watch still ticks, doesn't stop, anything like that. But uh, we seem pretty good at this point. So we're gonna demagnetize, and we're gonna throw on the timing machine and see what our initial assessment is. So here we have our um, initial timing and amplitude results. Um, this is actually the following day. I didn't have time to finish the video yesterday. Plus, uh, it's always good to let the amplitude settle in. So initial results were around 200, 195. Um, but you can see what happens after time. So now we're at kind of 223, 225, around that. Um, we can check in all the different positions. But uh, yeah, we've got a good, strong amplitude. And uh, I can regulate the watch and uh, we'll get the rest of it together. So we've gone ahead and we've put the... Uh dial side together, the calendar work, um, and the winding and setting work. So uh, we can go ahead and check all the functions. Um, we've got our date moving around like so. If we push harder, we can see that our day is also going to, to function. Um, and we can check our time setting, regular time setting, and we can see that we're flicking over nicely there. So what I'm going to do now is um, we're going to fit our day disc, and then um, I'm not sure if we're getting a dial and hand reloom on this one, I'm just waiting to hear back from the customer, and then uh, we can go from there and get her cased up, and we'll see the final product. The other thing we're going to do is uh, we're going to reloom the dial in hands. Just got approval from the customer to do that. So uh, we can see the old dial here. Um, looms quite quite bad on the dial in the hands. So we'll uh, get to relooming that and we can show the finished product. Okay, so here we go with a fresh... Okay, so here we go with a freshly loomed dial in hand set. You can see we've gone with a nice uh, nice bright white loom here. Got all that old moldy, mucky stuff off there. And uh, we're looking pretty good. Shame about the dial in a couple of spots, but you know, such is life. We can't do much about the, the aged spots. We've got a little bit of discoloration here on the hand. It's almost gone like a bit of a metallic color on the red seconds hand, but we're gonna leave that one as is. And we're gonna leave that uh, seconds hand too. So we're now, the other problem that I noticed when I was doing it is uh, the seconds hand was resetting to about there and then someone had bent the tip back um, to, uh, to, to, to put it exactly on the marker. Now you can get away with bending the tip back like a really small amount. If you're just off, you can just, you know, cheat it a little bit. Um, but I'm talking only a tiny amount if you just want to get it on the marker. Um, you know, and it's 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 completely imperceptible um, at that point. But uh, the correct way is to cut the cut the cent center out of the hand. So, as you may or may not know, the chronograph um, wheel has a square on it, so it always snaps back to the same spot. And the problem is, if that square's in the wrong spot, or if the hand's been compressed down onto that square, it's going to reset uh, to a different. Uh, it's going to reset. Well, you're not going to be able to reset it to a different spot. It's always going to go back to that square. So you can cut the square with a small smoothing brooch. So I cut the square out. Um, and then you can tighten up the pipe of the hand. So we can see here we've started the chronograph. Do, 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 do. Let it go round. And I'm just, I've got a problem with my, my reset push here. I've got to talk to Adrian about getting some more of these. Uh, and then we reset. And we can see that we reset to our spot uh, it's it's kind of tough uh, on camera here to see but we can see we're resetting to zero at that point in fact 
that hand is still a little bit bent at the end. I, uh, I tried to bend it back as much as I could to get it straight, but, uh, Bent further down. Do a bit of live repair for you guys here. It's the problem when people start bending them in different spots. It uh, creates chaos, as it were. Set that. And there we go. Here she is, the finished product. We've uh, kept the original crystal that it came in with. There's a small chip on one of the edges, but uh, it's nothing too much to worry about. We can see that uh, our chrono functions correctly as it should. We start, stop, and reset. Everything's working correctly as it should. All issues repaired. We can set the time. And the bezel is uh, what well, we can set. The date, the day. Everything's as it should be. Now we'll get to taking the case back off. We can see the issues that were repaired in here. Um, I cleaned up as much as I could of the rust everywhere uh, and all the bearing surfaces that need it. Um, the rotor had actually come unriveted in this section, so I riveted the rotor back up so that we didn't need to replace that. Um, we can see it's nice and free. It's fully wound right now, but it's winding uh, extremely well like it should be. Um, fixed all the end shakes there, and what else did I do? There's another thing. Oh, we can see that as far as our bearing goes, we are good. We are minimal, so that bearing has been tightened up nicely. And there we have it. Around 220, 225 amplitude. Uh, got about a 10 second gain, so I'll uh, do a few uh, some testing. See how we go uh, over the various positions. Um, 0.4 beat area, we're within uh, a 0.7 tolerance there, but we can maybe bring that down a little bit. Uh, we'll see how it goes after a couple of days of testing. And uh, happy with uh, happy with the results and the overhaul uh, overall. So uh, it's now running as it should, all issues corrected. So uh, thanks for watching, guys. Thanks for uh, enjoying the video. If you enjoyed the video, please uh, tell your Seiko mad friends about it, about the channel. Um, please subscribe to the channel, uh, like the video. You can also check out my Instagram at the psychologist uh, and check out my website to the psychologist.com for all information, pricing, uh, warranty, all that stuff. So thanks again and uh, catch you guys next time. Cheers.